Hello, whippersnappers. Mike Amori from the WCA, ready for the week two update. Yeah, this is going to be a little tough because um, I'm going to push you guys. I'm going to repost a video or do a game over that I did a couple of years ago uh, from the fried liver attack or the two nights defense that you're looking at now because this opening has come up a lot in classes. I'm looking at your games and the tournaments that I visit. Uh, this move here, knight g5, gets a lot of the beginners confused or the, or, or the like players in reserve section because you you see white breaking a rule. You know, you're taught don't move the same minor piece twice in the opening. Get all your pieces out. You know, if we go back, you see that white still has the bishop up here on c1 to get out and the knight here on b8. Sorry, didn't want to get that out right away. There we go. Um, so you go like, well, what's the deal with this move knight g5? Well, whenever a strong player does that to you, they have a good reason because that's the second half of the rule. The rule says don't move the same piece twice in the opening, but what's the second part? Unless you have a good reason. And here, white definitely has a good reason because they're attacking the F7 pawn. Um, what a lot of kids do, they'll just move something out of the way. That pawn will get captured, you get forked, and blah, blah, blah. It's just usually not so good. As you get better, you learn the move D5 which kind of saves the day for the moment, but there's still a couple of traps that you have to be aware of. If white takes the pawn, and they usually do, a lot of you, the first time you see the fried liver attack, well, that actually comes after this move. If you take the pawn back right away with the knight, you get hit with the move knight takes f7, which looks like a complete blunder because white's giving up a knight for a pawn. But the problem is after you take, and you really have to take here because you are forked. You guys see how the queen and the um, rook are being attacked by that knight. When you take back, you get now attacked with queen f3 check, which is a double attack. She's attacking the knight and she's attacking the king. The only way that you can protect both or get out of check and save the knight is you have to play this move king e6 and i really recommend that you don't play this unless you put a lot of time into studying how to defend this you're up a piece with black but white is going to be castling very soon they're going to play moves like knight c3 attacking this pin knight again they're going to play moves like d4 which open up the center with your king here so if you're not used to this, you could really get crushed. Okay, um, oh please, and whatever you do, don't uh, after you get checked, don't play king g8, because then you get mated, and this happened to a couple of us recently. The queen will just take, check, you take, check, you block, <laughs> check, <laughs> checkmate, ouchie. Yeah, don't let that happen to you. So let's go back. In the game that I want to show you, um, from here, after the fried liver attempt on this square, we play the move d5. When they take, a lot of you now have learned the move knight a5. So I want to show you a game that was played in 1974 by Arthur Bisguire, who's, uh, man, he's been around forever. I I'm not sure if he's still playing anymore, Arthur. But uh, back in the 70s, uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, he was uh, quite a force out there. Um, this strange looking move, knight a5, putting the knight on the side of the board. But, you know, you kind of have the right to be playing strange moves because white started it. You know, it's like fighting with your little brother. Well, he started it. <laughs> well, white did when they played this move, knight g5. They hopped to our side of the board before they developed their pieces and they're trying to get at our king. So we shut out the bishop, they take the pawn, and we play this cool move, knight a5. It attacks the bishop. We're trying to give white a problem here. And the, more, the most common move is for the bishop to check our king. And here, as black, you have to be willing to give up a pawn. So you block the bishop with c6. And white usually takes, and now we don't want to take with the knight. We want to take with the B pawn to gain a tempo, to make the white bishop move away. In the game I'm going to show you, uh, the bishop went to E2. Now, this is a model game. 
I can't promise you that white is going to follow the same moves and you can memorize this game and win is black. That's not going to be the case. But what I want to share with you as we go through the game are some of the ideas that black is going to play. Okay, it's black's move in this position. All right, so we're, I'm going to show you black's move and it's going to be the move h6 which is very common in this position. We're going to kick that knight away that's in our territory. Once the knight moves away, we're going to have to think, is it worth giving up a pawn for this position? Well, a lot of players think it is. If you put this on most computers, really strong ones, they'll, they'll tell you the position is pretty equal, meaning there are chances for both sides. You have to know who you are in this position. I gave up a pawn. I gave up a pawn because I'm going to knock the white knight away, number one. Number two, my remaining bishops, you see these guys down here, should have no trouble coming into the game, uh, including this bishop over here. Um, my king should get castled pretty quickly. So if I can add up, and don't forget I have a B file here if I need it. Um, so if you add up the fact that your remaining pieces are going to get out quickly, you're going to chase white's best piece, that knight on g5 is getting kicked, your king is going to be secure. When you add all that up, it's kind of worth going for this. So if you ever got this position in a real game, enjoy yourself. It can be a lot of fun. All right, so the knight goes back to f3, and here, which is another theme, the knight gets kicked again with this move e4. So try to remember those ideas. See the bishop on e2? You kick the knight once, it retreats to f3, you kick it again. Now white's a fighter. White doesn't want to just let you kick them all over the place. So they came right into your territory. Okay, pause the video. What would you do in this position? Okay, I hope you guys found the move bishop to d6, which is wonderful here. You develop a piece, you win a tempo. Do you know what that means? Time, you're winning time. White wants to develop his pieces but in this position, he can't because his knight's hanging here on e5. So he tries um, a move f4. Uh, the more common move is to play d4 in this position. But in the game I'm showing you, uh, white played f4. Now, f4 allows the en passant rule. Pawn takes pawn on f3. If you don't know the en passant rule, make sure you check with me in class. But I'm pretty sure all of you birds do. Now, the knight moves again because it's hanging here. So it moves again. Now, if you do the math, you are still down a pawn as black, but a couple of things have changed. Let me put a highlight on for you. Black managed to get the white F pawn out of the way. Now, white might argue that that was good for them because after they castle, uh, they're going to have a nice file for their rook. But the lines that I'm showing you, they kind of go in and out. So just because you have arrows on the board, you don't know who's going to use them. You know, for example, if I can get a bishop to c5 someday, that's going to be looking right into white's territory. Okay, so keep an eye on that. It, it's really a very double-edged game. Black to play. Don't get fancy. Black castle secures his king. White put a pawn in the middle, freeing the dark squared bishop, and I love black's next move. If you study this position carefully, you'll see that there's only one center pawn left, and it's this guy right here on d4. So what black decided to do was tell the pawn, hey, I'm going to try to get rid of you. And I think white made a bit of a mistake thinking that Wow, I can trade the pawn with you, and when you take back, I'm going to get to trade queens, which is what happened in the game. So you're going to trade queens when you're down a pawn? Well, that's what happened. But Bisquire with black, you ready for this? I'm going to turn some lights on. You see that diagonal? That bishop is preventing the white king from castling. That means something in this position. 
It also means something when there are no center pawns left in the game. When this game started, way back here on e4, there are four center pawns. Here, here, I'll turn them on for you. Here, 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 and here. All four are on the board, obviously. The game just started. But in our position, how many are left? The answer is zero. Zero. That means something when there are bishops on the board. You might argue, well, white has two bishops, so what's the big deal? The problem is black's bishops are going to get to those squares or cut through them long before um, white can do it. And don't forget, this bishop on c5 is preventing the white king from castling. So white is in a position where all the bishops are on the board, the game is wide open, but his king is stuck in the middle. Okay, white played bishop to d2, attacking the knight on a5. The knight relocates itself. Now, what would you do with it? You could come to b7 or or c6. Those are the two reasonable moves. So he chose c6. White continued developing, and now I love the way black handled this. If any of you play this opening, I know Sophie, there's a couple of you. It doesn't matter if you play this exact opening, but if you get a position like this where there are no pawns in the middle of the board, you need to make sure your pieces are active. Use the squares that are open. Knight g4. The idea, hey, why not come into this f2 square? I can annoy white here. Knight e4, attacking the bishop and covering the f2 square. You guys see what's going on here? Black retreats the bishop. Not interested in trading for that knight. So that's why he didn't protect his bishop. Because here, look at those squares. You see how weak they are? Compare the two dark squared bishops. Black's bishop is controlling all of these squares, where this bishop here is only has his eye on one of them. He can come out this way, but there's not a whole lot happening out here, is there? If he tries to come this way, not so sure it's going to be uh, that great for him. So if I had to buy one of those two bishops, I would pay more money for this guy. Do you agree? All right. Remember when we kicked Black's knight away? I'm sorry, White's knight away? When it was on our side of the board, we like said, hey, I'm going to get rid of you. That was back here. Remember we said pawn h6? We got rid of that knight. Well, in our position now on the board, white tried the same thing. Except there's a big difference. The black knight does not have to retreat into his own territory. It jumped in. And this knight just could not be tolerated. It's attacking a pawn on g2. It's attacking a pawn on c2. So if you're white, what do you do about that? Well, you snap it off. Problem, though, is now black is the only one with a dark squared bishop. White uh, gave up their dark squared bishop, giving black the two bishops in a wide open game. White's still surviving this, but they better be careful. Bishop d3 trying to close down the file. Black's turn brings his rook into the game and attacks this B pawn. Why? He wants the pawn to move, which is what happened. He moved the pawn to protect it. But by doing so, do you see how it opened up these dark squares? Let me go back. See? Let's put the pawn back. When you move the pawn, the squares to its left and right weaken. Let's see if that means anything a little bit later. Well, knight b4, another jump with the knight, attacking this bishop twice. You can see that the knight can come in here, and this rook on d8 is attacking the bishop. So white doesn't want to lose it, so he decides to move his king. There goes his castling right. He attacks our beautiful bishop. What do we do with that thing? Let the king take it? Absolutely not. What would you do with the bishop? Pause your video. Think about it. Bishop to b6. He kept it on the same square as before, and the bishop is doing the same amount of work. Rook h to d1. The rooks are trying to get into the battle and challenge these rooks down here. Black wants to connect their rooks, so he played b6 
bishop to b7 so these guys can keep an eye on each other. Knight went back to f2, keeping an eye on their bishop, and another knight jump. And this is no ordinary knight jump. Do you see where that knight could go? Remember that weak square I told you about? Yeah, if I check you here, I'm going to pick up one of your rooks. You guys see that? And that's all because we got this white pawn to move. This is such a beautiful game, like a model game of how to play this opening. Rook goes to e1 to avoid that. And then the knight decides, well, I could check. But instead, I'm going to jump right into the middle of the position and go after this pawn over here. Now, my friends, if this pawn gets captured for free, you lose more than just the pawn. This knight over here would lose its protection. Oops, I don't want that to move, sorry. It would lose its protection other than the king. And don't forget that there's this very powerful bishop pointing right at it. So I don't think white wanted to give up that pawn. So what does he do about it? He protects it with his rook, turning his rook into a babysitter. Now the tactics start. Rook e8. Why would a grandmaster do that? Well, the rook lines up with the king. You guys see what the, what's going on with these moves? And again, I'll remind you, there are no center pawns. This is just wide open chess. When the game's wide open, me personally, I'm glad I have the bishops. The king went to d2 to escape that. And what does the knight do? Back to d5. Why back to d5? Look at our bishop over here. I'll turn the light on. It's attacking a knight that's not protected. Let's go back to king d2. Do you see why white wants to move the knight? Uh, black, rather, gets it out of the way. And we have to be really, really careful. Knight goes to d1. He decides to give up the rook. He can't take it at this point because moving the knight to other places, a whole bunch of bad things can happen. So he wins the exchange. That's a rook for a minor piece. The knight takes back, and black is not done yet. Black, just because they have a rook, um, doesn't mean that they're winning the game. Don't forget, you were down a pawn. Knight f4, coming after the bishop. g3. Why does he take the bishop? Well, you don't want to really take with your king and have him wide open on this file. I don't think that would work out too well. So he decides to take with the pawn. But by taking with the pawn, that allows rook e6. That's called a rook lift. On the rook lifted from the bottom, knight to c3, and now rook d8. Black is hitting both files. Check these rooks out. See how this guy can go this way now, and this way, and this way? You think you guys can play like that? Of course you can. Just keep going over these games. Knight c to e2. And now, ooh, a target. Look at that pawn. You guys see the way that black can target that pawn? Bishop a6. Uh-oh. Pawn moves out of the way, protected by the knight right here. The knight is attacked twice. Check it out, my friends. Look at this. Wide open chess. See that? Well, let's attack it again. Rook d to e8. Knight jumps out of the way to f4, attacking our rook, and the rook jumps into e3. Pawn g4, saving the uh, pawn, and then rook here. And in this position, uh, in here, white decided to call it a day. Um, you have a problem. You're not going to be able to defend this pawn and knight at the same time. Um, if you think you can go back here to guard the pawn, uh, you're going to get in big trouble. We're just going to take it. And then uh, if you decide to take here, you lose that with check. And in this position, you're down a whole rook. Have a good night. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the game and you got the idea of the kinds of moves to play. If you ever got this position, keep it up. Chesskid.com. Work at it. Work at it. I'll see you next week.